All right, welcome to day four of the EOG review week one. Let's see what we're talking about today. We're still talking about figuring out unknown words within the text and what the author does to give us clues. Today we're going to be talking about, well, yesterday we talked about synonyms or examples of, here we're doing the opposite. We're talking about words that contrast or are the antonyms, the opposite of the unknown word. Um, we have lots of signal words, lots of clues for this. If your sentence uses but, however, although, otherwise, unless, instead, on the contrary, on the other hand, while, never, no, or not, then chances are you have a contrasting word or an antonym in the sentence. For example, Mike's parrot was loquacious, but Maria's said very little. That but, go ahead and giggle, that but lets us know that Maria's is the opposite. Maria's parrot says very little. So loquacious must mean the opposite of talks very little, and loquacious must mean talks a lot, and it does. Some of you are quite loquacious. Here's some other examples. When the light brightens, the pupils of the eyes contract. However, when it grows darker, they dilate. So this lets me know that contract and dilate are opposites. Well, when things contract, they get smaller. And when they dilate, then they then the pupils of your eyes get bigger. Okay. The children were as different as day and night. He was a lively conversationalist, but she was reserved and taciturn. So if he was a lively conversationalist, means he has very lively conversations. He has um, energetic talking, and she's very calm and talks a little bit less. She's taciturn. Another thing an author can do is um, give you a description of a situation or an experience and let you apply what you know about that to help you infer the meaning of a word. Infer means you take your background knowledge and what you know from the text and you, it's more than a guess because it's educated. You make an educated guess about the word. You make an inference. This goes back to my favorite story. So if you go to a restaurant and you notice that there's this table of people in the back room and they're all sitting around the table and there's a bunch of them and it's a loud group and they're all wearing these pointy hats and there's a table on behind them and it has lots of like colorful boxes on it um and then somebody who works at the restaurant comes out and she is holding this cake and it's on fire and she sets it down in front of this kid and nobody seems alarmed by it in fact if they all start singing a song and at the end of the song the kid spits on the cake and then they all clap and cheer what do you infer is happening yeah, I never once used the word birthday, but you recognize the description of the party hats, the presents, the cake with the candles, the birthday song, the, the tradition of blowing out the candles, and the cheers and applause that come after. You took all the clues and you made an inference. So let's look at this next sentence. The monkey's vociferous chatter made me wish I had earplugs. Well, I know that chatter usually means like talking. Well, monkeys don't talk, but they make noise, right? And whatever it is, it made me wish I had earplugs. And I wish I had earplugs when things are really loud, like concerts or sometimes um, in class. I'm just saying. Um, so vociferous must mean that it was loud or it was a lot of noise because it made me wish I had earplugs. She told her friend, I'm through with blind dates forever. What a dull evening. I was bored every minute. The conversation was absolutely vapid. Well, if it was dull and she was bored, then vapid must mean dull and boring. And you're right. Another thing we can do when we're given words that we don't know is look at the words etymology. And etymology means looking at the different parts of the words. So we know how to find words that are plural, and we know that if you put um, un in front of a word, it means not. So um, Bob is helpful. George is unhelpful. 
well, then George is not helpful, right? So I can look at prefixes that way. If I reread something or I resubmit a test or I um, rewind the videotape, which you all know nothing about, um, it means I'm doing it again. I'm rereading it. I'm reading it again. I'm resubmitting it. I'm submitting it again. I'm retaking the test. I'm taking it again. Um, if something is non-refundable, it's not refundable. If it's non-dairy, it's not made of dairy. So we know how to look for prefixes and we know about suffixes. So um, if we add an ed to a word, it typically means that it's already happened. It's in the past. If we add an s or an ing, it's usually happening right now. Um, we can also look at just the root words and figure out what the word means based on on what the the middle part, the root of the word means. So, um, incredible. Well, if something is credible, it means you can believe it. It can be trusted. And the prefix in means not. So if it's incredible, it's not believable. It's unbelievable. Now, does that mean it's not true? No, but incredible stories um, are often hard to believe because they're just, it's not normal. <laughs> um, this is a great word. Um, somnambulist had to be locked in his bedroom at night for his own safety. So when you amble around the room, or if someone is ambulatory after a surgery, it means they're able to walk. Um, amble means walk. So let's keep going here. Somn, S-O-M-N, means sleep. Okay, and an ist, art, artist, means a person who does art, right? So ist is the person who. So you have a sleep, walk, person. So a person who's sleepwalking is a somnambulist. Not a great word. But we wouldn't know that if we didn't know how to pick words apart. And that is where I think we're going to stop for today. Yep. So there's a game to play. Go play the game and then come back to your Google form for the graded assignment. If you have any questions, please email me and let me know. I'm happy to help you.